Well, good morning, everyone. We're here this morning and able to gather at this table uh, because of the wonderful grace of God. And I doubt that any of us here would deny that we have been the recipients of that grace. And apart from that grace, there would be no way that we could uh, approach uh, a place as, as holy as this. And yet here we are, uh, God's uh, recipients of his amazing grace. And if you've ever needed grace, I mean really needed grace, like uh, the devil has you dead to rights. And there's, there's no way out of this situation. And uh, the only thing you can do is throw yourself upon the mercy and grace of God. Then you know how amazing grace is to receive it. It can be a rather uh, unsettling thing when it comes our time to extend it, but when we need it, it's the most amazing thing in the world. It's been defined a number of ways. Most commonly, we call it unearned favor or unmerited favor, undeserved blessing that God bestows in our life. Someone has used the acronym for grace as God's riches at Christ's expense, and that's, a, I think, a helpful way to think of it. But really, grace, I think, can only be understood in terms of a relationship. In terms of a relationship with another person as we experience firsthand their grace extended to us. And so this morning, I want to simply tell you the story of someone who received abundant grace and mercy in his life, and then explain how that relates to us here this morning gathered at this table. In 1 Timothy 1, verse 13 beginning, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy later uh, on in his life, he says, even though I was once a blasphemer, now, the word blasphemer is not one we use all the time in day-to-day -day language, and it mainly has to do with saying things, uh, uh, profane things about holy things. And so when Paul here says that he was once a blasphemer, he's referring to the fact that he once said things about Jesus that were profane. And he said, I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor. That is, he persecuted Christians, as we will see in a moment. And a violent man. A violent man. I received mercy, though, he says, because I acted out of ignorance in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly. Notice those words. The grace of our Lord Jesus was poured out on me abundantly. Along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. And so he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. So why did Jesus come? Jesus came to save sinners. What kind of sinners? The very worst of sinners. That's who Jesus came to save. I've thought a lot about this expression, the worst of sinners or the chief of sinners, uh, through the years and wondered exactly what does Paul mean by that. And I, I just take him to, to mean by that, I was as, as great a sinner as you can imagine. When we think of sin, we maybe remember uh, some of the etymology of that word, that it literally is an uh, archery term that describes missing the target, missing the mark. And so what Paul is saying about his, his life is that if, if I were an arrow shot by God toward a target to accomplish a particular purpose of what it means to be a human being and what God sent me into this world to, to, to be for him and for others, if he had shot me toward that target, I not only was missing the bullseye, I was missing the target altogether. I was an arrow that had gone astray and was veering as far off course as it could possibly go. And so I was the chief of sinners. And we might wonder, well, how did, how did Paul uh, or Saul, as we know him at this point, how did he get to that place? He must have gotten involved in a street gang. Maybe he was 
uh, you know, caught up in the drug culture of his day or, or, or whatever it was. He must have really, really tripped up. But the, the fact of the matter is he was, he was from a stable home, apparently. He was highly educated and he was um, deeply religious and upwardly mobile in his society. And yet he describes himself as completely off the target. We're introduced to him under the name of Saul by way of a conflict that he was having with another biblical character by the name of of Stephen. And Stephen, we're told in the book of Acts, was a man who was noted for a couple of things. Number one, he was a minister in the church at Jerusalem to the widows. He made it his concern to make sure that the widows of the congregation were taken care of, that they were fed uh, and and received the things that they needed every day. And he was also someone who did everything within his power, and he had some considerable ability in this regard to share the gospel of Jesus with his fellow countrymen. Not the kind of thing that you would maybe think of as being, making you the, the target of someone's anger and hostility. But there was something about the way Stephen conducted himself, something about the words that he spoke and the ministry that he performed that that Saul just couldn't take. It says in chapter 6 and verse 9 of Acts that some men from Cilicia, and remember that Saul was from Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. So it's very likely that Saul is a part of this group, one of these men from Cilicia who rose up and disputed with Stephen. But it says in verse 10 that they could not resist the spirit with, and the wisdom with which Stephen spoke. So here likely is Saul and other men from the region of, 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 of Cilicia at their synagogue arguing with Stephen about the things that he's saying about Jesus as the Messiah, the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. And Saul, with all of his learning and all of his great intellect, is unable to resist the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen is speaking. And so rather than accepting the words of his opponent, he begins to work to undermine him. And along with others, they raise up false witnesses to come and say slanderous things about Stephen. And the outcome of that, we're told in chapter 7 and verse 58, was simply this. They then cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that Saul just happened to be standing around and when they needed a place to throw their their garments, they said, hey, you know, kid, would you watch these so that nothing happens to them? I think the idea of, of them putting their garments at his feet means that these are the witnesses that likely he has helped gather together to make testimony against Stephen, and he is, as it were, officiating over this whole affair. And so we see that he is there and likely chiefly responsible for the death of Stephen. But this only emboldened Saul to begin to build a career as a prosecutor. Um, Maybe not, not to necessarily equate all prosecutors with Saul of Tarsus, but you get the idea. You've seen the movies of, of someone who, who, who's a, a, a high-powered uh, attorney and gets the understanding that he can go to work for the state and he can get some, some, some prosecutions and some convictions and he realizes he's good at this and so he's going to build a career as a prosecutor. And that's kind of what we see going on with Saul. He's good at this. And I I can make serious advances among my people as a prosecutor of of this sect of of, of Christians. And so he does this. And in Acts 26 and verse 9, Saul himself says these words when later in life he's on trial, but giving a a history of, of his life. Says, I was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put to death many of the Lord's people and and, and put them into prison. And when they were put to death, I, I cast my vote against them. And many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished. 
and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. So he has an obsession by his own admission that is beyond measure of persecuting Christians, trying to silence the name of Jesus, stamp the movement that Jesus had begun from the face of the earth, was imprisoning people, doing everything within his power. And when he had done all he could in Jerusalem, began to realize that this message was spreading to surrounding areas. And so he began to get permission to travel there and to persecute and arrest Christians wherever he could find them. And it was on one of these hunting expeditions, his words, hunting them down. He was hunting Christians on the way, all the way up north of Judea and Samaria in Galilee, up into the regions of Syria. And he was going to the city of Damascus to do this. A, couple, a year and a half ago, uh, we had the privilege of going over there. And one of the things that really struck me, this is a, a, a hilltop looking down from the northern part of Israel into Syria. And between those two hills that you may be able to make out on the horizon is the city of Damascus, the ancient city of Damascus. And because of the way that Paul tells the story that he was approaching this city when this happened, he said about noon, a light brighter than the noonday sun shone about him and his companions. And in Acts 26, 14, he says, we all fell to the ground. And I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. Then I asked, who are you, Lord? The answer was, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Well, this wrecked Saul. Um, He was blinded by the vision of, He stopped eating for three days, and he was constantly praying. And as he began to try to process what all of this meant, undoubtedly he began to think about people like Stephen and others that he had cast his vote against to see that they also were executed. All the families that he had disrupted, the lives that he had ruined, thinking that he was doing the will of God, but all of a sudden now he is coming to that realization that these are people that God deeply loved. And what great harm I've done. And so as he is sent on into the city, the Lord arranges for him to have a meeting with a a man by the name of Ananias. And we're told in Acts 22, 14, that Ananias told Saul, the God God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will now be his witness to all the people of what you have seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on the name of the Lord. can only imagine the feelings of relief that must have rushed over Saul as he thought about Jesus, as it were, through Ananias, saying to him, I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to show you what amazing grace I have. And only that I'm going to use this grace to change you, to turn you into a different kind of person. We don't have any of Paul's correspondence before his conversion, but I doubt that the word grace was very frequently used in his writings. But if you read the 13 letters that we have of the Apostle Paul today, 26 times at every, the beginning of every letter and the conclusion of every letter Paul wrote, he says at the start something like, grace to you. And at the end, may the grace and peace of God and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. In other words, all of Paul's writings begin and end with grace. If you want to understand the writings of Paul, you must understand them within the context 
of his being amazed by the grace of God and his great desire to see that same grace extended to and shaping the lives of everyone he came into contact with. And so we see Paul's uh, amazing conversion and this tremendous grace. But the question may come for us this morning is, is how does that relate to us? And how does it relate to our gathering here around the table? And I think to answer that, we have to go back to where we started in 1 Timothy 1. Where Paul writes to his young friend, the very reason I was shown mercy was so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would come to believe in him and receive eternal life. God chose the worst of sinners. He chose someone who was violent, who was filled with anger, hostility, and hatred to the point of literally ravaging the church, killing people, imprisoning people, disrupting lives. God said, I want to take someone who is that far off course and religiously warped in his thinking so that I can show the power of my grace at work in the life of a human being. So that no one from that time forward would be able to look at his life and not say, you know, perhaps God could reach even me where I am. And maybe your path off target off of the intentions that God had for your life when he created you and gave you life. Maybe, maybe you realize that you too are going astray. You're off target. You're missing the mark. But if God could work this wonderful grace into the life of Saul of Tarsus, then surely his grace reaches me. And so Saul's life is not just a biography, which is an account of a person's life. It is a testimony to the power of God's grace to transform a life. And so this isn't just a story of what he did back then, but it is what he can do now. It's not just a story of what he did to him. It's what he, a story of what he can do in you and in me. And so if our lives are off toward target, if we are that arrow going astray, then grace is God's power to forgive us and to correct our course, to change us. And we might say, yeah, but Saul of Tarsus had this amazing encounter with Jesus, personally heard him and saw him and all of that. But, but even that, I want us to notice that the outcome of that, he didn't get relief necessarily from that, but he got relief when he heard the words of the evangelist Ananias say to him, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins and, and cry out upon the Lord. And he did that and he received pardon and forgiveness. And that's an offer that's extended to all of us. It's a once in a lifetime thing that you come into a, a covenant union with Christ in the waters of baptism, a tangible thing that you, you, you can actually feel as the waters come over you and overwhelm you and you rise up from that watery grave in newness of life. And we can remember that moment for all of our lives. But then he also gives us another tangible evidence of his grace. Every week, we have the privilege of coming to his table, a table he has prepared for us out of his abundant grace, a grace that is edible, a grace that is drinkable, a grace that reminds us of his great mercy and love for us. And so there's an old song that says, is it for me, dear Savior? Could it possibly be that this grace that's for others could actually be for me? And how could I know? Well, this is how we know. This is the memorial he has left us to remember that his grace reaches you. In writing to the church at Corinth, Paul said these words, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, and after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, do this as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. At this time, we'll ask those who have been appointed to come before us and serve the supper.